Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. In this video, I will be talking about osteomyelitis. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. And if you want to see more nursing education content, please consider subscribing to my channel. So osteomyelitis refers to a bone infection commonly caused by the microorganism Staph aureus, though many other microorganisms can cause osteomyelitis as well. There are two ways in which microorganisms can enter the body and cause osteomyelitis, indirect and direct entry. Indirect entry refers to microorganisms traveling via the bloodstream. This type of entry is most common in the growing bone of boys younger than 12 years old due to the high incidence of blood trauma. Indirect entry is also common in patients with vascular insufficiency disorders such as those with diabetes or other patients with pre-existing infections. In contrast, direct entry pertains to microorganisms passing through an open wound such as those in any penetrating wounds and fractures. Microorganisms can also enter the body via any implanted devices such as any prosthetics. So here is a flow chart that details the pathophysiology and progression of osteomyelitis starting with either indirect or direct entry of microorganisms. Once microorganisms gain entry into the bone, they begin to proliferate, increasing bone pressure due to the fact that bone itself is a rigid and inflexible space. This increase in bone pressure leads to decreased circulation which results in ischemia and vascular compromise. As these microorganisms continue to spread and proliferate, they lead to cortical devascularization and necrosis, basically meaning bone death. The area of dead bone which is called the sequestra then separates from areas of the bone that continues to receive blood supply. The new bone that forms around the sequestra is called the involucrum. It's particularly important to note that any antibiotics given through the bloodstream such as with IV antibiotics or any white blood cells can have a difficult time reaching the site of infection due to the lack of circulation in the area. Moreover, the sequestrum can become a breeding ground for microorganisms, which can then travel to other parts of the body, ultimately causing the patient to become septic. If the sequestrum doesn't resolve, sinus tracts or tunneling wounds can develop, causing purulent drainage through the skin. So here is a series of images depicting the pathophysiology of osteomyelitis, starting from the initial stages of infection inside the bone. Then in the second picture, microorganisms proliferate, increasing bone pressure and thus decrease circulation and poor blood supply. Then in the third picture, there is sequestrum formation, which is the area of dead bone as a result of prolonged ischemia and involucrum formation, which is the formation of new bone. So there are two types of osteomyelitis, acute and chronic osteomyelitis. Acute osteomyelitis pertains to initial infection or any infection that lasts for less than a month. Both local and systemic manifestations are typically present in acute osteomyelitis. Down below lists the signs and symptoms of both local and systemic manifestations. In local manifestations, you would notice bone pain unrelieved by rest and increases with activity, uh, swelling and warmth to the area of infection, tenderness and drainage to the area, which is a late sign. Systemic manifestations are more general in their signs and symptoms of having an infection, such as chills, night sweats, nausea, malaise, fever, and restlessness. In contrast, chronic osteomyelitis refers to any infection that has yet to resolve, refractory to therapy, or infection lasting longer than a month. Local manifestations tend to be more common in chronic osteomyelitis with systemic manifestations diminished. Some complications of osteomyelitis include septicemia and septic arthritis, which both relate to infection. Pathologic fractures can also occur due to the eventual malformation of bone as a result of infection, which we discussed earlier in the pathophysiology section. Amyloidosis, which is the development of abnormal proteins, can also occur with chronic osteomyelitis, which can eventually be life-threatening. In regard to diagnosing osteomyelitis, a bone biopsy or soft tissue biopsy would be the go-to diagnostic tool in determining osteomyelitis and its causative agent. Other labs such as increased white blood cell count or elevated ESR can also be found in patients with osteomyelitis. Other scans such as an x-ray can also be helpful, but it's important to note that abnormalities typically don't show up until several days to weeks after the initial infection. Radionuclide bone scans, CT scans, and MRIs are also used to diagnose osteomyelitis. So with regard to medical treatment, aggressive treatment with IV antibiotics is the first-line treatment with acute osteomyelitis, as long as any ischemia hasn't occurred. Typically, you would obtain cultures first or a bone biopsy before beginning any antibiotic therapy. 
If the antibiotic therapy has to be delayed, we surgically debride and decompress the area. At the hospital, patients diagnosed with osteomyelitis start aggressive IV antibiotic therapy. Then they are either discharged home or a sniff to continue antibiotic treatment for a few weeks to months. In chronic osteomyelitis, patients may receive oral therapies with fluoroquinolones in place of IV antibiotics. Furthermore, oral antibiotics can be administered to ensure resolution of osteomyelitis following treatment with IV antibiotics. Such resolution is monitored through bone scans and ESR tests. Other treatments of chronic osteomyelitis include removal of necrotic tissue and prolonged use of antibiotics. Antibiotic beads can also be implanted to the area to prevent infection. Following surgical debridement, the affected extremity is immobilized to decrease pain and possibility of fractures, which is a complication of osteomyelitis. Hyperbaric oxygen is typically used for cases of osteomyelitis that are refractory to treatment, and the indication to use this type of treatment is that it increases circulation and healing. If the damage caused by osteomyelitis is irreversible, amputation may then be the best option for the patient. So with nursing interventions, it's important to first identify patients who are at higher risk for osteomyelitis, such as the immunocompromised, those with prosthetic devices, and patients with vascular insufficiency, such as with diabetics. It's important to educate these patients regarding the signs and symptoms of osteomyelitis and to highlight that they need to report these symptoms right away to their provider so that prompt treatment can be started. With acute interventions, it's important to immobilize the affected extremity using either a splint or traction to decrease pain or fractures. Also, assess the patient's pain level, medicate them as needed, and assess for their pain medication's effectiveness. With regard to any open wounds, it's important to always use sterile technique during dressing changes to prevent the spread of infection. With patients admitted with osteomyelitis, they are sometimes placed on bed rest, so it's important to decrease complications associated with immobility, such as by turning patients at least every two hours to prevent pressure injuries and keeping extremities in their proper alignment to decrease contractures and foot drop. With regard to medications, it's important to educate patients about certain drugs, like fluoroquinolones, which can cause tendon rupture. Also identify which antibiotics require peak and trough levels so that any adverse side effects can be minimized. Also educate patients regarding the consequences regarding prolonged antibiotic use, as they can promote growth of other microorganisms such as candida and C. diff. With candida, educate patients to report any whitish curd-like lesions, and with C. diff, instruct them to report any new onset diarrhea. Prior to discharging patients to either a skilled nursing facility or at home, always educate them or their caregiver regarding the proper care of their IV site, how and when to take the medications, and any follow-up labs and diagnostics. Also highlight that they need to take all their antibiotics to completion even when symptoms have resolved. Also teach them the proper technique on how to do dressing changes as well. And that pretty much concludes the nursing considerations of osteomyelitis. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. And again, please consider subscribing to my channel for more content.